my long and winding road of doing uh, five different startups uh, in California, China, and Hong Kong. Um, some quick background, uh, parents are from China, grew up in Taiwan, went to grad school in the States. I was born in LA, my dad was a professor at UCLA, went to Maryland when I was five, he went to go teach at Maryland. Uh, mom was a programmer, grew up there, then eventually went out to Berkeley for college, and that's where we'll begin. So my format is I'm basically just going to have one slide for every company with some bullet points, and every bullet point is just a story. And there's a lot. So I don't know if I'll be able to go through everything. So the first company I started was called Human Ingenuity. It was, uh, I actually left school, um, Berkeley, after two years um, with a couple of different friends. We're filming it, I'm seeing that. With a couple of different friends, uh, all from Berkeley, and basically um, the reasoning was a little bit of impatience. Just felt like uh, school didn't seem like we were learning all that much interesting stuff, and I just wanted to rush out and do something. And then the second reason was what I, what I say friendship is I moved around a lot when I was little, and I felt like you know people like graduate high school, they spread all over the place. They graduate college, they spread all over the place. Um, but then. You know, your work friends aren't the same, as, as good as your college friends aren't as good as your high school friends. So I felt like, you know, why does it have to be like that? So why not start up some stuff with some friends and go from there? So we left after, convinced a couple guys, four of us total. Uh, we left after the second year of college to start this. We were basically selling computer systems and components. We were close enough to, like, Fremont, Mountain View, all that stuff that we could literally drive down there half an hour to an hour to buy whatever parts we needed, uh, and then we bring it back and, and either sell the components or actually build systems for people. Uh, we were running out of an apartment. Um, uh, basically, the one good thing that happened to us was um, we actually did a deal with the mechanical engineering department at Berkeley, where we um, went in, did a bid, managed to win the bid, uh, and filled like two um, full computer labs worth of systems to them. And that was probably our, one of our biggest deals at the time. Down, uh, we actually got in trouble one time with the FBI um, <laughs> because one of our guys, he was he was a genius of, of getting on message boards and whatever and finding like really, really good deals. And I guess he found a deal that was maybe too good and where he bought a whole bunch of uh, Flexster. I, I don't even know if they're still around. Flexster like CD-ROMs and hard drives for like a really good price and bought a bunch and then him and, some, and our other partner, they were like on vacation. I was still at the office apartment, you know, selling stuff. And one day, one morning, I hear knocking the door, and a guy comes in and he's like, "I need to talk to you." And I'm like, "Okay." And and basically, he was like the FBI or, or something, some kind of or police officer, and essentially was saying that those products that we had were actually stolen. I guess it was someone who worked at Plexter was like literally taking them off the trucks or something. So. Um, the guy on our, in our company who actually got the deal was incredibly nervous, and we actually had to go to like Sacramento to the court, and uh, supposedly we were supposed to go and be questioned and everything, but I guess they never needed us because they, they had enough evidence against the guy and put him in jail, but uh, that was interesting. Then later on, um, we kind of stopped. A lot of us went back to school, but then um, we went to go work at a motherboard manufacturer called Asus, based in Taiwan. But they actually had like a, their, I guess U.S. office was down in like San Jose. So we worked there for a summer. Um, and during that time, we we're doing tech support. And actually that was an interesting story is when we called them to, we said, well, if we're selling computer system components, we should kind of try to understand more about, like a little bit deeper in beyond just putting it together. So we went to apply. Um, we wrote an email in, uh, their, I guess their vice president called and, and did a phone interview, or no, he actually set up an interview for us to come in, and we had never done any like tech support kind of stuff before. And he had us all, all these questions, and we basically just gave kind of the best guess for everything, uh, and pretty much every question we got wrong. But I guess he he liked our energy, so he hired us. And after the summer, I left, but then one of the four guys was still there, and eventually he got a deal with ASUS where we would take over their tech support for the states. And they're paying like 
I think it was like 7,000 US a month or something, which was pretty good. Um, and so then we decided to try to reopen an actual store in Berkeley. Um, and so that was kind of like Human Engineering version 2.0. Uh, after we launched, though, um, pretty soon afterwards, uh, first day we opened, we had zero sales, you know. Um, and uh, after a little while, they actually kicked me out of the company. Um, and part of that was, one mistake was we didn't clearly define our equity between people. And uh, I think that led to a little bit of a problem. And the second thing was just, in the second version, it was one of the four guys plus myself that originally started it. Um, we, uh, he brought in some other people. And so it wasn't the original four, it was two of us out of the four. And so what we just found was really there's too many cooks, too many people who are trying to run it, and that can cause problems. Um, of the four people, one of the guys, the guy who actually got in trouble with the law, you know, don't put this online anywhere. But he was, uh, him and his brother, the Fong brothers, this guy named Lyle Fong, and he actually went to Berkeley with me. He, him and his brother started a company called Gamers.com afterwards raised a bunch of money. Uh, the younger brother, Dennis, was actually like the best Quake player in the world. Um, and uh, won like a Ferrari and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then they ran gamers and went under. They raised a bunch of money, like 12 million. But then from that, the older brother, Lyle, went on to make a company called Lithium using the same technology, the message boards and all that stuff. And that company's done very well. I think they've raised like over 30 million. Um, and then the younger brother, Dennis, uh, made a company called Xpire, which was like, instant messaging within games. They sold to, I think, Viacom for like 100 million. And now he's doing another company called Raptor. And they've also raised like over 30 million. So they're, Lyle's like definitely one of the success stories coming out of Berkeley. Um, and one thing we learned is uh, retail is hard. Um, versus if you do pure internet or mobile or things like that, when you're actually doing with inventory, it can be a problem. You need to have a lot of money up front. People don't always pay you right away especially like when we were working with the uh, mechanical engineering department, they didn't pay up front, you know. Um, and then the other thing was, uh, especially when you're working with um, computer components, back, especially back then, you know, memory or uh, CPUs were extremely expensive. At the same time, they dropped really rapidly. So if you had any excess inventory sitting around, it was like losing a lot of value like every day. So some stuff to learn. Chapter two, design reactor. So from there, I guess after I was kicked out, I had another a couple friends who were, um, they were doing uh, a web design firm. And this is like pretty early on. This is, uh, let's see, about 97. So 95, or 93 was when we first started doing human ingenuity. 97 was when we do, did Design Reactor. Uh, Steven, who was actually uh, our co-founder and CTO of all my later companies as well. Um, so he had him and two other friends doing a web design firm, and I basically kind of joined forces with them to do another web design firm. Right after we decided to start, we, we uh, took a loan from my family and his family. Uh, his other two partners, one decided she wanted to go into consulting and left, and uh, the other one decided he wanted to go and teach English in Korea for like a year, so he left. So then it just became Steve and I. Uh, we actually had got an office space in uh, in Berkeley um, for pretty cheap and we just started trying to do everything for everyone so meaning we we're going to do print uh, web design and 3d design for any industry and what we learned was actually focus is better so very quickly we we cut out print because you know it's a pain in the ass to um have to meet deadlines like two weeks before when it actually comes out because you know they have to actually bring the printers and check the colors and all that stuff. So we were like, after we did a couple of jobs, we're like, no more print. Um, and then 3D was also very tough because back then computers weren't that powerful. So you do any job, you have to like, every computer you had in the office, you'd have to render the whole night and just to see how it looks, you know, like the next day. What year is this? Uh, 97. Wow. So we were just like, forget 3D. So later on we said, okay, just web design. And after we did web design, we very quickly also realized we don't want to do it for everybody. We, we did some, like a dentist site and some tech company and some other stuff, and we're like, no, that sucks. So we later on focused on Zust 
uh, interactive design, web design for the entertainment industry. And that's when everything kind of made sense. That's when our portfolio, everything in the portfolio made sense with each other versus, you know, if you're a movie site, movie company, you don't care that I did a dentist website. So one big uh, up, a positive thing was Disney. So during that time we worked with, uh, we were helping with logos and other stuff, mostly on the tech side because that's um, from human ingenuity, those were the kind of contexts we had. Uh, we ended up working on a site called Tom's Hardware. I don't, I don't know if it's still around. Yeah. But back in the day, it was very influential among like tech guys. Um, but then it turned out that the guy, the president of that was actually his daughter was working at Disney. And so they were all going to be at, I think it was Comdex in Vegas. So we went over, we were just kind of hanging out. We thought maybe we'd get some more contacts for more of design jobs. When we were there, we met her. And it turned out at the time that um, Disney had just fired, Disney Channel had just fired their main web developer um, because uh, I guess there was some disgruntled engineer within, programmer within that company that like put a curse word in that somehow managed to get through three layers of QA and went live. And with Disney, they're extremely protective of stuff like that. So they were instantly gone. Um, so she was like, do you have any, any work that you could show us? The thing is we had no uh, entertainment work at the time. So what we did, came back right away, I think it was like a, a long weekend, called a bunch of my friends, people who weren't even working with us, and we went, we all met at the office, we looked through their site, we saw, hey, they have a Mighty Ducks 2 um, coming out on, on their show on the Disney Channel, and they don't have a website for it. So we, we rented the movie, watched it, and um, <laughs> actually built a full site two working games and I think it was like Flash or Director, uh, logos, like wallpapers, all that stuff, you know, bios of all the kids, everything. And we and we sent it them like Monday, like literally the weekend after, like three or four days later. And we're like, check this out, you know, we don't have anything that matches what you're looking for, but what do you think about this? And um, she knew, I mean, when she saw it, she knew we couldn't possibly have had that like ready prior to meeting her. Um, <laughs> And so, and so, actually, she liked it, and uh, they decided to actually buy the two games that we had made. It was like one was like a Pong, but like looking like a hockey rink, you know, things like that. Um, I don't remember what the other one was, but um, and they paid us at the time. We were doing like the dentist websites and this and that for like thousand, two thousand, whatever. They paid us twelve thousand five hundred for the two games. Um, so it was like immediately like a whole world of difference. Um, and eventually, we ended up doing more and more and more work for them where they eventually just signed like a million dollar deal for like year long development of like almost all their Disney Channel stuff. But I'm not sure if you, ever, if you guys ever watched, but there's this thing called Zoo Disney they had for a while. And like pretty much almost every game they had like we were building. We built like 50 games for them at the time. Um, so that's one. Another one that was interesting was Jet Li. Um, so, a lot of us, we're, we're all from Berkeley, we're all, we all knew each other from doing wushu, which is Chinese, a, a form of Chinese martial arts. And Jet Li was like a champion of that, so we were all huge fans of him. Around this time, he was coming to LA. We heard he was going to be in LA for the, a comic convention there to promote uh, Lethal Weapon 4, which was like his first big movie in the States. So we're like, okay, let's just drive down there and go check it out. Uh, me and, and Rafi, when I, uh, at that time, just a friend. Uh, went down there, and it turned out we knew these uh, wushu coaches that knew him from back when he was actually just an athlete. Uh, so they came along, we went over to the comic convention, and because we need these coaches, they kind of got us in the back. And while he was signing, and we were standing in the back, his publicist was back there. So while we were back there, I'm just like, hey, you know, does he have a website? And he did it uh, at the time. So, so essentially got our info and just followed up, did, you know, did some meetings with her. We didn't charge him because we just wanted to do it. But you know, we, we made a bunch of comps, same idea, bunch of comps, bought it over, showed them, they liked the idea, and decided to go with it. Um, and actually, it ended up leading to us getting uh, work with artists and entertainment because they did, they brought over Black Mask, and um, we also did the website for uh, Romeo Must Die, which was a Warner Brothers movie, and those basically came through him. So it still ended up working out, even though he didn't pay us directly, he got us some some jobs and. Um, uh, but don't look at any of those sites because they're really bad. 
like now. <laughs> you know. um, and then a lot, another thing was uh, what I call harder, better, faster, stronger, which was our big, um, really our, a way we competed against everyone else was we were essentially what well, we thought we were better. Um, we were way faster, uh, more creative, and, and cheaper. Um, but what happened was at Disney, uh, they had mass, like really, really fast turnaround. So people you work with, like half a year later, they're gone, they're somewhere else. So they ended up kind of helping to bring us everywhere. Like um, we all had someone else who went to Warner Brothers who brought us in, separate from Jet, um, uh, MTV, VH1, ABC. So and then we never actually had to do any, uh, besides these first couple, we never had to chase anyone else. Actually, we would just be brought to other places because they knew they could bring us in and we would make them look good. And, um, and help us, you know, uh, we could make them look good, they could make, help us get more work. One mistake we realized though, um, was actually having employees versus contractors, because one problem with uh, web design, or probably any service company is, it was, it was kind of up and down. You know, sometimes you'd have way more work than you could possibly handle, and sometimes you'd have like nothing for like a month or two, or, or so. So one thing I think we could have improved was um, actually having uh, a lot, like a base of employees, but then have a pool of extra contractors that you could adjust based on your your demand that month. Um, we eventually uh, passed Design Reactor on to another group in order to do Rotten Tomatoes. Um, the other group, there was ups and downs with that. One down was uh, these are people that we had already kind of referred some of our projects that we felt were too small. Um, so we would give to them and they did a good job with it. So we felt sort of comfortable with them. Um, and they were actually like college friends with uh, one of the guys in our company. But after we passed it to them, I guess the main guy was like a singular owner who had like almost complete ownership of the company. And at first we got along very well with their group, but then somehow after we transferred the company to him, I don't know what it was, because I wasn't there, but he like, slowly kept firing all the people we knew and eventually it was like, a totally different group. And it just, uh, I don't know, we, we didn't approve of a lot of the ways he was doing things. Like we felt like he should have been more free about giving equity to people and I don't know. So there were some issues there. But then on the positive side, um, they ended up, at least in the beginning, they ended up extending and doing more uh, web design work. So right as we passed it to them, we ended up doing, um, the Flash game for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire back when it was actually popular. And I think at the time it was the most popular Flash game ever up to that point. Um, after we passed it to them, they ended up doing official websites for A Beautiful Mind, Cat in the Hat, Born Identity, and The Hulk, the Ang Lee version. Um, but then I think later on now, they're much more tech focused. Uh, and another thing we learned was service doesn't scale. So uh, one big reason why we switched over to Rotten Tomatoes was because we saw all our friends raising a lot of money, selling for a lot of money. People, like companies that we helped work on their stuff, um, and we were growing, you know, pretty fast. But I mean, it was, but it was like this. It was just a line. So we thought maybe we should try jumping into actually building a product, and so that's why we went and made this transition. So chapter three, Rotten Tomatoes. Um, so the start. Our creative director Sen, he was the one who actually came up with Rotten Tomatoes. He was a big movie buff. Um, a friend I knew from freshman year of college. He was on my same floor in my dorm. Um, so he actually, the concept behind it was back then, open up a, even now I think, you open up a newspaper, you'll see a full page ad of a poster of, the, of a movie, and it would have all these quotes. And, um, but they'd always be good quotes. And if it was actually a bad movie, they'd be quotes from like random radio station in the middle of nowhere from some guy you never heard of. And there'd be a lot of those kind of quotes. I mean, if it's a good one, then it'd be like uh, Cisco and Ebert or, or things like that. So his idea was this, well, what if you put in all the quotes, good and bad? Um, and so that's how it started. I think the first one he did was Rush Hour because he's a big Jackie Chan fan. But when he first did it, he was doing everything manually, building every page manually, finding every quote manually. Um, and he did it for a, a little over a year. Um, we were hosting it for him, and we noticed it was getting, you know, like Netscape, Cool Site of the Day, or Yahoo, whatever. I mean, this is a while ago. This is '98, August '98, um, and uh, but it slowly started getting more traffic. 
And then I think one time back then they had like a Yahoo magazine. This is a long time ago. And I think um, Roger Ebert actually was picking out like interesting movie sites and he listed that one out of like, I don't know, 10 at the time. And we were like, you know, this is, this is interesting. Maybe we should do something with this. So that combined with, at the time we saw, you know, our friends at Gamers raising 12 million. We had another friend doing a company called um, Killer App that sold the scene for, I think, 70 or 70 million, something like that. And they bought it just to kill it because they had a, it was very similar to another product called My Simon that they paid like 800 million for. And I think they also killed. But, but yeah, they bought it just to kill it. I mean, it was crazy. Um, so, so at the time we, we were doing that and we were actually, when we raised funding for it, we were trying to decide between two different, completely different companies. One was Rotten Tomatoes and one was like an Asian American community site. Um, because we, we knew Jet Li, uh, Jet Li actually was at the time very interested in internet uh, because I guess he saw Shanda in China and he was like, I want to do something and he was like, I'll get Jackie Chan on board and you know, and we had uh, different contacts with like Asian American magazines and stuff. And so we're like, you know, maybe that'd be an in interesting, you know. Um, talk to some investors and they're like, Rotten Tomatoes. Like every single one was like, just Rotten Tomatoes. Um, because Rotten Tomatoes mainstream, it, I, I don't know how many of you are from the States, but Asian Americans are like, oh, three It was four. Asian Avenue and Kuta yeah. Asia back in yeah. the day. Yeah, like so there were sites. those ones, but we were like, oh, we could do a better job. But actually, all those companies are dead. So I think the investors were correct. So we ended up raising a uh, million US for it. Uh, this is January of 2000, and the bubble burst. Uh, I think three months later, like everything went to hell, like really badly. And so we had actually had like 20 something people uh, from that we kind of carried over from our design firm to do Ron Tomatoes. And after the market crashed, uh, we cut down to 14. 11 and then seven, all within about a year. And, but we cut very early. Like we cut knowing that we would need to conserve cash. Um, and we went to seven, we actually were break even by that point. Um, and we tried to do it in a nice way. We, we basically said, uh, we, need to, we need to cut down on people. Um, there's a couple people who were like, don't go anywhere. But then everyone else were like just, try to find a job. So some people found it right away, some people took like two or three months. So then we didn't have, you know, so they didn't have like a gap. Um, and actually a lot of those guys like went to Pixar, Blizzard, um, ILM, uh, Fox Sports. So like decent places. Um, we learned that big isn't always better. Uh, meaning when we first started Rotten Tomatoes, we identified when we were doing research about 100 companies that we thought were kind of competitive within like uh, internet and entertainment. Um, and pretty much after the market crash, literally within a year, everything but the big one, but the, but the ones that were already bought or uh, the small ones were dead. Uh, I'm not sure you guys remember, like den.net and um, pop.com and uh, iFilm was, had, had some stuff and um, a bunch of those kind of sites. They had raised, some of them raised like 100 million and they just, the problem with those companies back then and you may be seeing it now, was they would raise a lot of money to grow like crazy, to screw revenue, to raise more money, to grow, to raise more money, and then eventually IPO. Like that was just the path they, they took. And that was a, like the correct path back then. But what, what, how many people know any of those sites? How many people? I just want to see how many old people there are in this room. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking like really old history here. But um, <laughs> many apparently. But essentially when, when the market crashed, these companies were still spending millions of dollars per month no revenue, and then revenue at that point in time was pretty much impossible to come by. Like the ma advertising market just completely crashed. Um, so they all died. And what was left, at least within the movie space, it was the little ones. It was the Dark Horizons, the Anical News, things like that, or the ones owned by corporate. IMDb was already owned by uh, Amazon. Uh, Movies.com was owned by Disney or one of them, or Yahoo Movies. Like those are the ones that kind of stuck around. Um, but we also learned that uh, on the revenue expenses side, there's one thing you can really control, and that's expenses. So you can't always predict revenue, especially when the market is very, very bad, but you can control your expenses. So a lot of times, if you want to get break even, you cut, you cut down until you pretty much match whatever your revenue is, and then as your revenue rises, grow your expenses. Um, and I think people don't always get that. They always like, 
I'm going to hold my expenses steady and try to get the revenue up to match that, but that doesn't always work. Um, eventually, things were improving, uh, and then 9-11 and then happened. Um, and when that happened, for about six months, the, uh, the advertising market also took a, a pretty strong dip again. Um, and so uh, it was tough. Uh, right before then, we were getting starting to get companies uh, inquiring about about buying us, uh, and then that you know that went away. Um, so eventually, things picked back up. Um, one of the highlights for us was Daily Show. Um, one day, me and one of the other guys at Rotten Tomatoes were watching a Daily Show, and uh, and then suddenly John Stewart's in, like interviewing a guy, and then he started talking about Rotten Tomatoes. Just like right there while we're watching, and I think it was a, for that movie Eternal Sunshine of Spotless Mind, and we were just like, like oh my god, oh my god. Like, <laughs> like just freaked out. And we had mentions before. I think we had like Ebert and Roper, but it was on a Sunday, and we actually saw Spike because it was a Sunday. But um, but that was the first one, at least for for me, where we were actually like watching it, and then he just started doing it, and we, it was just crazy. I think actually in the last month he did it again, and and uh, Stephen Colbert also did it which was kind of cool, but people emailed us because I didn't actually see it live. Um, so after the market kind of improved, uh, we started getting offers again, um, people trying to come and buy us, and uh, and eventually we took one. We sold to IG Entertainment uh, in 2004, and at the time we did try to do our best attempt at, at matching, so we talked to like, I think it was like Hollywood.com and uh, CNET, because they own GameSpot, which was competitive to IGN, and a couple other companies, and we, pretty much the price we were getting seemed reasonable, and so we decided to take it. We wanted to try something new. Um, one mistake, though, is I think, uh, and some of my other entrepreneur friends have said this to me, was we were thinking too small. Um, I think on our end, because pretty much we went through uh, the internet bubble bursting and 9-11, we became very uh, chicken. Um, and so for us, we just, our, our only like goal line was can we want to at least sell above what we raise money at so we can make our investors at least back their money. Um, and that was it. And so when we started getting offers above it, and we're like, let's take it. And we, we actually had like a couple of VCs approaching us around that time just because they were kind of interested like what's going on with, with you guys. And I think had we thought bigger, we probably could have, like, possibly could have made it something larger than it, than it is. Um, we sold to IGN, they sold to News Corp a year later, News Corp traded us to Flickster uh, a couple of years after that, and then Flickster slash Rotten Tomatoes just sold to Warner Brothers, I think like uh, two months ago or a month ago, um, and they say 60 to 90, I heard it was like around 90 million, so we sold for 10. So. Um, there might have been more that we could have done with it. For instance, had we been more like Web 2.0-ish, maybe, maybe we should have been making Flickster. You know? um, and then one thing we learned was value of networking, because we were actually located in Emeryville, um, which is like, we were like kind of close to Pixar. But the problem with being in Emeryville was we weren't in Silicon Valley, we weren't in Hollywood. You know, even though those were the two, we should have been in one of those two places. Um, so the only time we went down to LA was to meet with marketing teams of studios. You know, besides that, we never met, at that time we never met any directors or producers or anyone else within Hollywood. And we really didn't know almost anyone on the internet side, uh, except for like I had a friend who did Hot or Not, who was also from Berkeley. Um, and that's why I knew him. So uh, one thing that people had also said to me was, you know, had we, had we actually been more proactive about networking, we were just very happily in the office, just building a product. And we, we were just focused on building a, something that we thought was cool. But had we went out and talked to people more, I think a, a couple things. One, um, even if we sold at the same time, a lot of people were like, you probably could have done double if you just knew more people to create more of a competitive atmosphere. Second was, probably they would have said, don't sell, because we actually sold before Google went public, and after they went public, like everything increased in value a lot. Um, and actually, Google had approached us right before we sold, like literally two weeks before we like closed everything. But we already had a no shop. We already had about 
300000 in legal fees set up from all the negotiation and everything. And so we were just like, it doesn't make sense for us to stop it, um, eat the legal fees, try to wait six months for the no shop to expire, and then talk to Google, and they may or may not actually buy us. But um, yeah, so that's another thing. And then just you know, possibly have raising, raised money or whatever, had we been out there more aggressively networking. So these are things that hopefully I, I try to learn more in the future. What was the total that you raised the Rotten Tomatoes? One million. That's it? Yeah. Uh, and the post money was six. So we made a little bit, not a lot. But even, we had offers where they, um, from the company that started MySpace, I can't remember the name now, uh, the one before this, that sold it to New Sports. What? Intermex? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's the one. Um, and they actually were ones that tried to buy us way before, um, but uh, for like 10 cents on the dollar. And actually at the time, there were investors that were like, take it, because they lost like everything on everything else. So, but we were like, no, it, it doesn't make sense for us. So what was the year that you sold? We sold in um, in uh, 2004, so I think we, we did about five five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long was that? That was shot. Um, I think most of them had, you know, they were like, yeah, that's cool. You know, they they weren't. Only one group was like, maybe you should wait. Um, but I think part of it was we ran it for so long, and um, I think when you do something like that, it was like five years, and it's kind of becoming the same thing every day. And we just like, yeah, let's try something new. You know, sell it and and we should be able to raise money for another project um, based on people knowing Rotten Tomatoes. I think it was six months, but I don't remember for sure. I mean, it was a while. That's a, yeah. That's a really long time. Yeah, and it was, um, yeah, we just thought it would be bad faith to be, to try to sit it out and, and whatever. And, and at the time, you know, 300,000 in legal fees, we'd have to pay that no matter what. And it's not like we had like 300,000 just sitting around. That also seems like I didn't know enough from my experience. Was, like, was there a reason why? Was there something you learned about that? Well, we, uh, we used a company called Oric, which is very expensive. Um, it was referred by one of our investors. Um, but what I've heard is, for the most part, it doesn't almost doesn't matter what you sell for. It's going to be around that price if you sell for $10 million or $100 million. So selling for more is better because uh, the legal fees will be about the same. Um, chapter 4. So after we sold, I went to China. I was actually planning on going there to uh, try to start a dating site um, because of what my friend was doing with Hot or Not. You know, they had similar traffic to us at uh, Rotten Tomatoes, but they um, there's two guys that started it for fun. They were they most people don't even know they actually were a dating site, um, and uh, they had maybe 100,000 subscribers paying five dollars a month, which is six million a year, plus some ads. At their peak, they were making close to 10 million a year. Ron Tomatoes, we were doing like two or three million, you know, and we had seven, and when we sold, we had 10 people. And they had a couple extra people, but it was like so automated, so easy for them, that they barely had to do any work. I mean, they bought a house in Hawaii, in a car, and they were just chilling there, literally, for like a year or two. Um, and we were, so we were looking at that, we're like, wow, that's, that's interesting, you know. Um, so we, uh, yeah, so after we sold, I wanted, I'm like, I'll come to China, start a dating site. That was my big plan. Came out here and I ended up meeting up with my friend from the first company, Human Ingenuity. Uh, he was from a part of China called Shaman, and, uh, and he was the one who actually kicked me out. Um, but he convinced me to join his company instead, a company called Shaban, which means after work. Um, and. Uh, what it was, was now looking back, I'm like, it was ahead of its time. Essentially, what it did was, it was a little bit like Yelp, merchant ratings and reviews, but they actually had a physical card reader that they would put into merchants' stores, and they had a loyalty card, and people could go in, and they could go and swipe. After they order whatever, they would swipe, and the idea would be, merchants could then track it, and be able to make offers and know who their loyal customers and all that kind of stuff. And, and we would make a little bit of cut off of the tracking that swiping part. And I mean, if you look at stuff nowadays, you know, kind of like Foursquare and stuff like that, I mean, yeah, they're doing it through a phone, but actually in China, they're, they're actually starting to use real readers because they realize like, you could just walk by and check in without actually going in, you know? So it's weird, but like many years later, this is 2000, like 2005 around, 
you know, now, six years later, you're starting to actually see something like that. Um, so we raised uh, 1.3 million, and one big mistake was raising a lot of it from friends and family. Um, and normally I wouldn't have done it, but after Ron Tomatoes, they were like, hey, when you do your next one, can we put in? And I'm like, uh, sure. But actually, it's not good, because then, uh, one, I mean, they're not sophisticated. Two, if you screw it up, you know, your friends and family won't be happy with you. And, and because they're not sophisticated, they don't always know, like, hey, these things are big risk, and you know, um, and they don't add value. Uh, they can't really help you in any way. So it's better to try and get from strategic investors. Uh, so one of the big things we ran into pretty quickly after we launched it was um, what we found was in China, and maybe this might be a China thing or it might just be a everyone thing. Was yeah, they put the machines in, but then pretty soon what we found out was they would give people discounts when they came in with a card, but they didn't want to swipe. One, they didn't want to pay us for that. Two, they don't want anything that can track their sales records because they don't like paying tax. So they want to keep everything cash. You know, they, they also, a lot of them don't like credit cards for the same reason. So, so it didn't do, you know, that model, we realized pretty quickly, like, hey, it's not gonna work. So eventually we kind of took some of the remaining uh, money we had and we bought a local community bulletin board system, just forums, called xmfish.com, and they're just within Shaman. But within Shaman, I think like 90-something percent of all the people using the internet in, in Shaman were using this, this bulletin board system. And I think their monthly uniques is like seven or eight million a month, um, and like 80 million or something page views. And the company is actually break-even, but it's been kind of uh, mostly steady and a little bit declined, especially recently because of competition. Uh, and that competition being um, with Weibo, people were now using that to do a lot of the communication, and it, it's actually been hurting a lot of the BBSs, which before then was really one of the biggest ways that people were communicating in China. And number two, all the Groupon phones, because Groupon phones are getting local revenue, and so they're competing for the exact same dollars that uh, XM Fish is going for. So it's it's been hurting it. Um, and hopefully we'll figure out some kind of uh, pivot or whatever to, to change the model to something better or, or sell it. Um, two things we learned, or maybe you could call this a mistake, was build on your strengths. So one thing was, after we sold Rotten Tomatoes, I'm like, I want to come out to China, I want to try something new. Hey, I'm Chinese, you know, uh, I've done the internet stuff and the Chinese market is growing really rapidly. I want to come out here and try it. But that was actually a huge mistake. Um, because I'm, I'm ABC, I'm only conversational Chinese. I think even if I was 100% fluent reading and writing and speaking, just culturally I'm, I'm too different from them. I mean, the way they do business, everything, guanxi and let's do banquets and karaoke, like it's it's not my style. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so that's one thing. <laughs> a second, I think a second thing related to that was, um, you know, suddenly we're going from entertainment the last two companies are doing a lot of work for entertainment companies to now doing something that is actually off, has a big offline component and is not related to entertainment. So that was a big, big change. And then the third thing was our contacts. You know, we, we didn't have the best network, but we had some network, network and we had recognition within within the states. Like people would know Rotten Tomatoes. But suddenly you come to China and then no one knows Rotten Tomatoes and we have no contacts that really can help us much for China. I mean, they can help us if we stayed in the in the Bay Area or went down to LA, but they can't help us in China. So that was something that we didn't really think about that clearly at the time. And yeah, and China's in the States is, is related to that. So my latest company, Alive Not Dead. So the way this one started was uh, we knew a friend um, from the Bay Area, his name is Daniel Wu, he's like an actor out here. Uh, but back then, you know, he was from the Bay Area, but he went to Oregon for school. But he would come back in the summers to train in Wushu. So we knew each other from doing martial arts together. Uh, so while we were doing Ron Tomatoes, he came out here and he became a big movie star. He, I think he came here for the handover and ended up modeling and got into a movie signed by Jackie Chan, etc., etc. So um, while I was doing uh, um, XM, XM Fish, Shaban, um, 
he had this idea, him and some of his friends, that they wanted to do a movie. He wanted to direct a movie. Normally he acts. And it was a movie called Heavenly Kings. So they pitched me over dinner, and I'm like, okay, that sounds good. So I put in some money for it. Uh, the movie was him and three friends, they made a fake boy band called Alive. Um, and they actually made uh, like music videos, they actually performed and made appearances and went to concerts and all that. Um, and the whole point of it was they were actually filming everything. They did like over 200 hours of footage and they made a mockumentary. Um, trying to make a statement about the entertainment industry. Uh, basically, how can these four 30-somethings, two of them are married, none of them can, well, one can sing and the three others cannot sing at all, <laughs> make a boy band and like people are just like, oh yeah, that's good, and they accept it. So it came out, um, you know, made its money back, and uh, Daniel got a Best New Director here, and it toured like, um, kind of like a B-tier-ish film festivals like Busan and Tokyo, San Francisco, like B, B film <laughs> Hong Kong International Film Festival, oh, and not, you know, Hawaii, not like Hawaii, Hawaii, Hawaii was fun. Um, so. So after they came out, um, the, the webs there was a website, Eleven and Dead, for the four of them. And they are like, let's do something more with it. And we said, I was like, well, a website for four of you is not a business. I mean, we were doing Jelly.com, we were doing um, KellyWho.com, and you, you, can't get any, you can't get enough traffic to really make any sense of that, any money from that. But we decided, hey, maybe let's make it like MySpace. And at the time, it seemed like a good idea. Um, but uh, when was this? This was... Four years ago, 2007 ish. Yeah. So, at the time, you know, my sister was still, still number one back then, um, and so we're like, okay, let's do it. We didn't actually raise money. Uh, myself and our CTO Stephen put in money as we went along, and in the beginning, we realized the power of celebrities. Like, they were able to attract other celebrities because of that. You know, getting like TV interviews and radio and magazine and all that kind of stuff, and it seemed all, it seemed pretty cool. But uh, we very quickly realized two issues. One, um, which we also realized from Rotten Tomatoes, but more so even for this one, is advertising-based models are very difficult. Um, essentially, if you can't get to some like minimum level of traffic, it's like you pretty much I mean, you can get some AdSense money, but it's that's almost zero. Even like even if you're Rotten Tomatoes, like we were making like a couple hundred of bucks a month from AdSense. I mean, it's like throwaway. But uh, if you can't get to something pretty high, you are pretty much can't make almost any money. And I think that's true for if you're a Facebook app or you're a mobile app or any of these other things that you guys might be developing. Um, second thing is, uh, is um, we base ourselves off the MySpace, but you know, you look at MySpace, that model is not really the best one to be chasing. Um, Facebook and Twitter just killed them in the States. And out here, it affected us as well. Um, and also on top of that, Weibo um, from Cena really hurt us. So all the users went to those play different platforms, and then all the celebrities would go. So um, yeah, a couple things we learned. One was the danger of doubling down, which is ideally you should put your time into something or your money. But really, when you do both, you're taking a lot of risks. Um, um, some of you guys may be doing that right now. Um, one thing you may want to consider is if you can try to raise money, like either do it where you're just putting in time, like you have a day job and you're you're working nights and weekends or whatever until you kind of maybe get some traction, or um, or you uh, you raise money. And if you can't convince someone to put their money into your idea, you know. Either maybe it's not a good idea, or maybe they might not be seeing far ahead, enough ahead, but I think that's part of the challenge is to try to get it to a point where people are like, okay, I'll put my money in. Then you're only taking half the risk. Uh, second thing is don't do too much. So when we did uh, Alive Not Dead, we had nine people, but we were trying to build a full-on social network. And we were even messing around with events, which I'm sure you guys may have gone a couple. Um, and other things that all take a lot of work. Um, and actually, right now we only have like uh, four people. Um, but how are you competing with Facebook and MySpace and Twitter that have 
you know, hundreds, thousands of people, um, and, and like limitless funding with that. You know, so it's better to try to stay, going back to the focus idea from my the first company, on something very small and doable, um, rather than trying to build. You know, we were trying to feature match them, and like it was just very, very difficult to do that. Uh, and then the, another one, which I just mentioned, was bootstrap the traction. So. Um, one, if you if you can't raise money right away um, on the idea, the next way of doing it is raising it off of actual traction, actually having a lot of users and and fast growth. Um, and if you look at a lot of the startups in the Bay Area, a lot of them were not even anything similar to what they end up being. You know, face, Facebook was like what like hot or not for Harvard. Um, YouTube was trying to be hot or not with video. Uh, um, hot or not was just, just, they just did it for fun. They're just like, let's throw this out and see what happens. You know, so um, even Twitter, right, was just a random experiment that one of their guys made. So a lot of times you don't know. And if they pitched it even back then, they wouldn't even know what they're pitching. Because what they eventually ended up with was nothing like what they started with. So sometimes, you know, you could just try putting it out there, see what happens. And if it starts getting growth, then then you can try raising money on it. Um, and now, so recently, uh, the last two three months, we've actually been trying to switch to a new model with Alive Not Dead. Um, it's going to be called Alive.cn. It's going to be the Alive Celebrity Network, and we're actually moving away from uh, anything consumer focused at all. So we're we're doing it as a B two B play, um, and trying to create a marketplace between celebrities and brands, and basically. A little bit like Adley in the States, a little bit like um, brands will pay celebrities to do endorsements through their social media, uh, through microblogs, blogs, videos. Um, and then separately, or in addition to that, also trying to develop celebrity analytics. So the two problems we see brands having is who should they work with on the celebrity side and how to contact them. And we're trying to solve those problems. Uh, and so the celebrity analytics was, you know, like Rotten Tomatoes, we were helping people decide what movie to see or what DVD rent. Um, in this case, we figure out help brands figure out what celebrities to work with. So we're we're doing that, and we're in the process of raising some money from strategic angels. Right, so CN is China, China website. Yeah, it's not CN. It's also China. We're focusing on Greater China, but we're also saying celebrity network. So it's yeah. kind of where. So, so after the experience of Shopify, how 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 do you um, do it better in the Um, I think it I think it'll be one um, you know having people like Daniel and stuff would, would help. You know, for Greater China, um, from Alive Not Dead, uh, we have like almost 1,800 artists, but I would say like two or 300 at least are celebrities. So we do have a base to start with. Marketing magazine says you surpassed one million members in China on the Weibo platform. Yeah, yeah, we did. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's the partnerships we have. Um, also, um, I think if you do business to business, it's a little bit easier. It's much more difficult, I think, when you're consumer facing. Um, because you have to kind of understand their, their particular tastes. In this case, we're dealing more with brands, and with multinational brands, at least a lot of them will also have you know people who are not necessarily just local. Um, and then you don't have to worry about censorship and all those other issues, which is a big, big problem. So, um, and I think hopefully the government won't really spend all time worrying about us until we're big. If we're small, hopefully they'll just like leave us alone. Um, so last part, just random uh, thoughts based on my experiences. Number one, if, for those of you still in school, I would recommend getting a computer science degree if you can. Um, I actually started E because I switched to computer science, I switched to business, and eventually ended up cognitive science. So I took some CS courses, but uh, if I could do it again, I would I would have finished in computer science. And one of my reason is is. If you don't have the technology background, but you want to do internet or mobile or apps or whatever, you're always going to need to find a CTO. And um, I think someone wrote on one of those TechCrunch or one of those things is there's nothing more dilutive than having a partner. Uh, so the minute you say, "Hey, let's let's partner up, 50-50," you just gave up 50 percent. You know. So um, plus, if you can do it yourself, you can just be like, "I'm at home and." No money, I'm messing around with some stuff. Here's an idea, here's an idea. And you can just do it. But if you're not the programmer guy, 
oh, I have this great idea, I have this great idea. What do you do? You're just stuck. Or you have to pay someone to go and do it or convince someone to do it, and it's, it's much more difficult. So for you guys over there, computer science. Second thing is um, start early. So when we started, I mean, we were like juniors in college. And I think it's best to, the earlier you start, I would like to say graduate first, but otherwise, the earlier you start, the better. Because uh, at that point in time, you can take risk. You're, you're living like a college student on ramen, you know, and whatever, and um, probably you're not married, you don't have kids, you don't have car payments, you don't have a house. So you potentially can move around, whatever. I hear a lot of people who are like, no, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go work for a couple years and I'm gonna learn and then maybe I'll get an MBA and then I'm gonna do a business. But you know what, I think that's, honestly, I think that's totally the wrong way to do it because when you have, by the time you get all through all those things, you're probably married with kids, with a house, with car payments, and you're probably making, in the States, six figures or something. How do you give that up to potentially be working for zero? You know, it's extremely risky, not just for yourself, but your friends and your family. Um, so I, I always recommend that people start early. And anyone who's like, well, I want to go work over first, they're just making excuses. Um, next one is do what you love. And I, I think this is pretty important. Um, it's you got to find something that's interesting to you. Not necessarily, I mean, yes, it's you try and find something that also is like business-wise very viable, but also interesting because you're probably going to, you know, YouTube was 18 months, but most companies are not like that. I mean, most companies you're talking probably five years or more. And if you're going to be doing something that long, and if it's a startup, you're probably putting in well above you know, 40 hours a week. And if you don't like it, then you're probably not going to make it. Um, fourth, it's not just about the money related to number three. Um, but a lot of times, just uh, people who are just doing things for money, it's not, I don't know, I feel like they don't always do it the right way. And they don't always make a product that's compelling. Um, some, some of them do. And that com what that site did, was it would just show you sites that are about to die. It was like the Deadpool. And all it did was ever talk about sites and companies that are about to die. And all you wanted as a company was to not show up there. <laughs> so you didn't worry about at all about hyping yourself up and talking yourself up. Because honestly, I don't think it matters. Who cares if you're on Mashable or on TechCrunch or mentioned on any of those places? You know, actually, you look at Quora, like, people hate them. I mean, they, they mention way too much. Um, just build something cool, and people will talk about you naturally. And don't. I think you don't need to spend almost any time really self-promotion. Uh, Jet Li's advice. So, um, a little bit after we were doing with the Bubble Burst, um, we were still working, helping Jet Li on his website. I think he was filming the one or one of those movies back then. Went over to say hi, um, and he's like, "How's it going?" And I was like, "Not so well. You know, the market's crashed. We had like a lot of people, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know, but Chen Li is a big time Buddhist. And one thing he said to us was, or said to me was, actually, everything is a circle. And if you're up, it's going to go down. And if you're down, it's going to go up. So right now you're at the down, and just be patient and it's going to go back up. And actually, <laughs> yeah. but actually when we, <laughs> looking back, he was right. I mean, you look at all these markets, they're up and down. And any of you guys who have been doing any kind of startup, I'm sure you've been through both. And it's like when you're when you're kicking ass, just kind of knowing that something may happen that's going to turn it back down is important. But also when you're down, to, to kind of know if you stick with it, it'll go back up. And it leads me to my last point, which is you only fail when you give up. So I mean, unless you're like, you know, the cops are after you, or you're <laughs> totally, you know, broke and you owe people money, but Outside of that, I mean, even if you're just, I'm stuck, I can't seem to figure out how to break out of this, you just keep at it. And sometimes you'll find some change in your strategy or something will change that will make it work. You know, so, yeah, I, I guess that's it.